So, Charlie, Joseph Martinez doesn't give up PKs to anyone. I mean, Pity Martinez was literally praying for it. Do you give that PK up if you're Joseph? I'm giving it up just because that's the no, kind of guy not. I am. I am. No, you're not. I am. I am. No, because I'd, be, I'd think, man, if I want to get him going and get him playing at his best and get him some confidence, and he's pleading with me like this, I have, I have 20 goals. Like, here you go. But you just lack that killer instinct, that competitive edge. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, yes. Charlie Davies and Bobby Warshaw. You will not throw me off, Charlie. I, I never intended to. Sure. No, sure. I love it. You're like Quincy Ameriqua. You know that? Oh, don't you dare <laughs> compare me just, to Quincy Ameriqua. Just saying, if you didn't see the game last night against LA, he's like yapping at people. He's all up in Zlatan's yeah, business. Nah. And then mm -hmm. he looks at who I don't even know who he said it to. It might have been Jonathan Dos Santos. Fabio Alvarez. Oh, what, whoever it was. And he said, I'm in your head. I'm in your head. That was you on me with this intro. Yeah, but it, I think it was done a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let's get to it. we got a big show today. The Bird Dogs, Sam Stachel is uh, going to drop by because breaking news in Major League Soccer on Sunday night, Mike Pecky was terminated as the head coach of Real Salt Lake. There are some details to get into there, some nuance, and just the facts. So we will get the, uh, to those in just a little bit. David Goss will stop by. He's in Atlanta for Campione's Cup. We will talk about MLS Week 23. We will hit the mailbag. It'll be a fun show. But first, Bobby's back. He's not... Jet lagged is jet lagged. Sloppy opening. That's bothering you right now. Yeah, I can I know, tell. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Charlie really is in your head. Yeah, it is bothering not, me. Not your best. Well, I appreciate you two just uh, tag teaming me here and just putting me in a terrible spot mentally. Talk about where were you? Where you were at? Yeah, man. All right? Back back from Jordan. It's the third year we've done this. My second year, but it's going on for three years. Uh, a few years ago, Medi Bellucci, you know, former RSL Colorado San Jose, he New retired FC. retired yeah. after New York City FC. When he retired, he wanted to do something for the world. He got in touch with some people. He started a foundation, and he decided he wanted to go and take soccer and equipment and clinics and just joy over to refugee camps in Jordan. One just on the border of Syria called Zatari. One a little farther away called Azraq. So the third year in a row we've gone, we do four days of, of clinics. I wouldn't even really call them soccer clinics or practices, but we take the gear, we interact with the people. We have four different groups of little kids, you know, hundreds of little kids throughout the day. And we just, we play soccer, we interact, we have lunch. Uh, we just do whatever we can to, to have fun with the children and the people in the camp. To be present. Mm -hmm. Could people help? Is there a way that people could help or like see what's going on or can you send them somewhere? There is, but let me check back in on that because we just took all the gear, so we're not going to collect gear right now. But gotcha. at some point, I will put out a tweet or Medi or Steven Lenhart goes, Satir Hot, former Red Bulls player goes. We all put out little tweets or messages to collect gear and to collect whatever okay. we need. What so was, thank what, you for asking. Yeah, what was the highlight for you? Ooh, the, the highlight is I, that profile came out on Lenny, Stephen Lenhart in The Athletic, and you got a little bit of a sense of what he is like as a person. To see Lenny interact with human beings, especially children at the camp and adults at the camp, it's an, it's an, an incredible thing to see. The way he makes eye contact, the way even though he can't share a single word, right, because it's all Arabic, and we try and coach, we try and interact, we try and talk, but you can't share a single word with these people, but Lenny still becomes best friends with everyone at the camp. So just to see him as a person, interact and you use the word he's the most present person i've ever been around to see him be present in these situations it, it, it's nice to see it's so good for everyone that interacts with him so that's definitely the best part of it very cool good that's reminder for, for yeah him. for our daily lives be present yeah. be present you know i'm just i'm just staring you down for no reason charlie just I feel right here it. I right feel here it. all right hey, i'm loving it <laughs> i love the vibes all right let's get into uh, mls week 23 every game matters or maybe not depending on if you're zlatan uh, let's talk about the winners we'll talk about the not winners which the la galaxy will be in that category bobby what's your winner for MLS Week 23. I think you got to take the Chicago Fire, man. They win against Montreal. They go up 2 nothing. They give up the lead. They score late on the Bash and Schweinsteiger header. If they had not won that game, if the impact had won, then the Fire would have been seven, nine points away, depending on the other results from the playoff line. But they do win. They win the six-point matchup, and they are only three points out 
from the seventh seed in the MLS. They saved their season with the win. That's mind-blowing. I cannot believe that they are that close given the season they've had so far. Just one win on the road all season. Montreal, they're in seventh. I would say, I don't know if they're a not winner, but this is definitely a disappointing not result for them. It is, although six of their last eight games are at home. That's Montreal good. has been done and dusted. They've been horrible, but they just need to reset, mentally recharge, six of eight at home down the stretch. And Bojan. So they've got some reinforcements in their squad as well. Lassie Lapalainen, he's been pretty good so far. We'll see if they can push on. Who's your winner, Charlie? FC Dallas. And sure, they played a not full-strength Minnesota United team, but they needed to win, and they needed to do it convincingly, which they did. Paxton Palmacall, again, continues to play well. He's developing. He gets up and down. What an engine he has. The creativity, the, the grit, tenacity. That's what you want to see from a young midfielder. He has it. It, It's one of those players that comes around not too often every cycle, and this is one kid that I really have an eye for. It's similar to Tyler Adams. When you saw him at an early age, you thought, this kid has it. Well, Paxton Pomichol is the real deal. I think it's even fair to say that he is a better player in his really his first year getting minutes. Tyler Adams is younger, right? So it's not entirely comparable. But as an overall player, he is better than Tyler Adams was than when Tyler Adams broke into Major League Soccer. You could say that Tyler had a higher ceiling. His athleticism, his ability to cover ground, you felt like he had a higher potential with it. But as a player, getting minutes in his first year in Major League Soccer, Pomichol is better. He's, he's been more of an impact, uh, I think, because they've had to rely on him much more than they did for Tyler Adams. However... Tyler Adams has grown exponentially. Yeah, higher ceiling. And, and, and now I think you can't even compare, right. really. When well, you can't compare at the moment, but right. I just want to... Yeah, look, we're on the same You're saying, yeah, 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 I exa- know exactly what you're saying. The nice thing is, is that for American soccer fans, both those guys are going to be wearing the colors for a long, long time, it seems. Talking about young players, there is a not winner from this game, and of course, Minnesota United losing this one. You know, when you call it MLSsoccer.com or MLS.com, this is what happens historically, 0-5-2. Says the advanced analytics after that happens from a player or a coach. I'm just saying, but we really talked up Mason Toy on this show and in the broadcast, and we have to mention it. He, late in this game, spit on Reggie Cannon and was shown a red card for it. He posted an apology on his Instagram. Go check that out. Um, he says his actions were distasteful, inexcusable, no place for it in the game of soccer. Couldn't agree more, Mason. Uh, a, a rash moment from him, and I assume that, that there may be more of a price to be paid because that's just not acceptable in the game. Can we touch on this for a second? Yeah, Andrew? go for it. Mm-hmm. I do want to add to this. What he did was horrible, right? Irreprehensible, no place in it. And I don't know how to word this except to say I don't want him to back away from the line too far, right? You don't do this. You don't step over the line, but you have to live on the line. And I'm going to watch him these next few games to see if he does become more timid. You look at the best strikers. They all got that little thing, right? Douglas, or Diego Costa is the best example. So what Mason Toy did was horrible, but he needs to continue to live close to that line and learn how not to cross that line, but keep the same intensity. Just don't go too far. That's a learning experience there. I, I think we'll be talking about this a little bit more yeah, as well I, from a coaching perspective because of the Mike Pecky news. But Mason Toy... Yeah, he's got something to learn from this. I like that you saw his veteran teammates, Charlie, and, and Darwin Quintero and Lawrence Olam immediately when you watch the replays. I mean, they're coming at him, and they're stepping to him in a, in a real way saying, hey, Mason, uh-uh, not acceptable. If there are positives to look uh, to or take from this, this incident, it's the fact that he's only 20 years old, he's a, he's a young player, and you're going to learn from this experience. So to have it happen now – so you can have this kind of be your one moment where you hit rock bottom, everyone's looking down at you, and you build yourself up from it. It, it adds to your character. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I think it's essential for a young player to have some adversity, to, to, to know what it feels like when everyone's against you because you made a mistake, and you have to rework um, you know, yourself out and, and feel like what it feels like to work in the trenches. Mm-hmm. And a guy like Mason Toy now, has to, to live up to the expectations of being this this talented young striker who can potentially play at the national team because he has all those tools. But now redeem yourself yeah. in front of your, not only your teammates and your, your coaches and your fan base, but the rest of the players in the league. Show respect to, the, to your competitors. And I think that's what we're going to see him do now for, for, the, for the time being. Year one, kind of a learning experience for Mason Toy. Didn't get a ton of playing time. He rededicated himself, he said. Learned, hey, this is what it takes to be a professional. That was on the field. This is a little bit more of an off-the-field aspect of it. Hopefully he rebuilds himself a little bit as well. My winner from Week 23, D.C. United. 
A couple hours before game time on Sunday, here comes the news from Pablo Maurer of The Athletic, who you hear on this very podcast often. And he says, oh, no, Wayne's not going to play. Upper respiratory illness. A lot of travel for Wayne Rooney. Back and forth, a little commuting from the north of England in Derby County, uh, but not available for this match. And it was kind of a gut punch because this was supposed to be probably realistically the one Zlatan v. Rooney matchup that we were going to get in Major League Soccer ever. Unless somehow they both get to MLS Cup, which doesn't feel all that likely. So it was a huge bummer. And you're thinking, man, DC have won twice since May 12th, which we've repeated over and over and over on this show and elsewhere. Uh, They're probably going to lose this game to the Galaxy with Christian Pavone debuting and starting. And then they threw it back to 2014. They made it a little bit ugly. They grinded it out. They got a huge win that they absolutely needed. They are still above that line, the dotted line, let's call it, in the standings now, which delineates that you are a playoff team, but you also get to host a home game to start things. It's a massive 2-1 win. To me, probably, I'm going to say they were the biggest winners because there is an element of doubt. There is a shadow over the rest of their season, which is Rooney's gone. Lucho will probably be gone. They might have to restart. And in this moment of adversity where they haven't been good for very for a long time, they stepped up to the plate. Now, maybe it's the competition. You guys can tell me that. But this this game, I'm not going to say it felt like the Rooney tackle and, and ball to Lucho, but it was kind of like a course correction of like, okay, okay, even if Wayne's not here, even if it is a little bit up in the air, we can find a way. Which would go to my biggest loser. Oh boy. Yeah. LA Galaxy. You sign great transition, Charlie. You sign Pavone, uh, who you finally have someone else who can who can score goals for you, who can create goals. You're not just a one dimensional team, super predictable where you're just launching balls into the box and hoping that Slaton gets on the end of it. You you have this player who's dynamic who can be on the touchline, dribble it in from the left to the right, and unleash these, these bombs with his with cannon of a right foot. Yet, Slatan Ibrahimovic, of all people, looked like he wasn't given 100%. Like he wasn't holding himself accountable. The work ethic was not there. The, the, the passion, the commitment. You look at uh, what he said in, in the, the, uh, about the playoffs and in we'll this get league, to that. and we'll yeah. get to that. I didn't see anything from him. In this match, when you need three points, because you look at that where they're at in the league table, 37 points, fifth place. Now you're really in the middle. You're, you're stuck in the middle between uh, Portland Timbers, who are a game back at eighth at the eighth spot with 34 points, and Seattle Sounders in the second spot with 39. You can't afford to give up games like this. This is a, a weak DC United team missing Acosta, who's on the bench, and Rooney, who's not available. That this is a three pointer for the Galaxy. You cannot afford to go to DC United and come up with zero points. It, uh, I'm I'm shocked, and still I'm not seeing patterns. I'm not seeing passing patterns. I'm still seeing them launch balls forward, or let's give it to Pavone and see what he can do. Can he can can he score goals for us? And and maybe he, he'll combine with Slatan. Everyone else, let's just defend and, and kick the ball forward. They're, I need more from them. They're in the middle of the pack of the Galaxy, and the pack is pretty tight in the Western Conference, as you mentioned. Here is a stat from Kevin Baxter of the LA Times on Twitter. The Galaxy are 5-10-0, five, five wins, 10 losses, outscored 28-16 to 16 in their last 15 games. So that, that's, not, that's not a good run of form, and we've kind of been talking about this for a while, and oftentimes, Bobby, you have been, I, I don't know if it's the voice of reason, but certainly the person willing to say Zlatan's not good for the Galaxy, and the Galaxy aren't actually very good over the course of the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. Are the Galaxy actually just, mm-hmm. is it a mediocre team? Mm, yes. Yeah, it is. Quite simply, I mean, Charlie's pointing out that he didn't play this hard. They've played 24 games. He hasn't played hard in 23 of them, right? He's played hard in one game. That was LAFC. He was amazing. We all know what he did, but this is a consistent problem. He doesn't press. He doesn't connect simple passes. He doesn't move off the ball. And listen, I'm not trying to say Zlatan isn't fantastic, and I wouldn't say he's bad for them. And I, I know that's not what you meant either. It's no. just It was the wording that you used. He's not bad for them. They obviously want Zlatan in their club for everything he offers. But if you're talking on the field, he is not a net positive for what they're bringing. He does not allow the sum of the parts to be greater than they are, which you need to win in soccer. Now, can the Galaxy win MLS Cup? Yes. Zlatan can score four bangers in four straight games. It could happen and be absolutely infuriating to anyone that is a legitimate soccer fan. And I'll go as far as to saying that, I'm not cheering against the Galaxy. I'm not cheering for them. This is a beautiful sport that can be played in aesthetically pleasing ways. They do not do it. 
I'm frustrated okay. now. That's it. I see that That's frustration. There was some uh, frustration last week or or cheerleading, depending on your perspective, about Zlatan's playoff comments. Basically, he said that uh, that the system doesn't um, doesn't encourage a strong mentality. Basically means that not every game matters as much, and if you can finish seventh, make the playoffs, and win the whole thing, quote, how do you create a mentality to be on your toes 24 hours a day? It's very difficult. And then that doesn't jive necessarily with what you guys are saying to me right now, which is that you haven't really seen that intensity from Zlatan throughout, and I also get a little bit confused because the Galaxy didn't even make the playoffs last yeah. year. Like They should hope that seventh would have got them in. I can I can acknowledge that some games mean more than other games, and that like a game against LAFC might not mean the same thing as like a Wednesday night game against, you know, or even like a, even a Sunday game against DC United outside your conference. Let's just say when you're above the playoff line. But I'm I question whether that's the system, or whether that's something much different. Especially when I look around the league and like if you're on LAFC this year. You can't tell me that every game doesn't matter. You can't tell me that they don't bring it every single game. I haven't seen them take their foot off the pedal really this year. I go back to the Red Bulls last year, half under Jesse Marsh and Chris Armas, and with Jesse before that win in Supporters Shields. It always felt like they were up for every single game. Toronto FC in their record season. It always felt like they were up for every game. San Jose this year, once they got things figured out and were committed, it, they were up for every game. Like, is it the system? That encourages that, or is it a lack of accountability from coaches to players and maybe from ownership and GMs down to coaches to say that a bad performance, a lack of effort, a lack of intensity, whatever it is, is just simply not acceptable. Every time you come out, there's paying fans in the stands. You're professional. Do the job and do it to the best of your abilities and to the best of your effort. Like, what is... We've seen we've seen the pressure start to grow now from each franchise or organization. It's, we're going to put the pressure on you from the very top. The expectations are to win at home. Every game you win at home for, for our fan base, when they come out, they want to see a team that wins, a competitive team. And on the road, get results. But at the end of the day, I want a, a, a team that's going to, to be uh, pleasing to the eye when I see them on the field. When, when they're out there, um, you know, whether it's breaking down teams in possession, whether it's having skillful players like a Carlos Vela who can you know, create something out of nothing – but having a team go out there and be proud of what they do. Can they give can they can I watch them and say, you know what? They gave 100% effort and they are a team that is going to to win more games than not with if we're going to give them a budget, you know, if you're talking about Atlanta United's of the world that have, you know, can can have 3 DPs who uh, you know, you're paying 15 million dollars for or is it a Cincinnati team that's like a new to the league and and goes out there and does the best that they can, but you're proud of what you see because the, the coach has got them in the right formation and they're getting the best out of the players, great. But if you're going out there and you're just, ah, oh, today we're going to take it easy, we're not going to play our best players, that's not good enough anymore. So I enjoy seeing franchises put pressure on the coaches and the players to give out, put out their the best performance every time they step on the field. It's a... I want to go to the the question about the regular season, the playoffs, because do I think if you had less teams getting to the playoffs, it would make for a spicier regular season? Probably. You know, it would add a little spice to the regular season. But the playoffs are fun. It's cool to have a robust playoff system where more teams get in, more underdogs can win. And it's you're trading one for the other, right? And that's what we're talking about. Is Zlatan, Zlatan wrong that there would be a little bit more to the regular season if less teams got in the playoffs? No, but then you might not have the same playoff structure. Americans like playoffs. Playoffs are fun. We have it in our culture. We have it in our sports culture. So I get where Zlatan's coming from, but you just have to remember that you then sacrifice something in the playoffs, and that's important to point out. So the percentage is above 50% for Major League Soccer this year, and I, you know, you, you can look at me and say, oh, you know, whatever, whatever, he says this for this that or that reason, and I hear from you in my DMs or on Twitter all the time. But, like, if you're, you know, from top to bottom in this league right now, everybody feels like they might have a chance. Some teams don't, and some teams are going to waste that chance, and you kind of talked about Chicago Fire in those terms. But, like, doesn't that maintain pressure throughout the season? Like, even if you were bad and you didn't perform to your, your standards, there's still an expectation on you. Come right now, if you're Peter Vermees, if you are Wilmer Cabrera, if you are well, those, those you know, are Orlando you, you City or the Chicago Fire or Columbus Crusade, like, well, those teams can't, the pressure can't, can't abate because you still have something that could potentially play for. And let's be honest – Getting into that seventh spot and losing immediately, like most teams at this point, 
aren't going to look at that and say, oh, man, success, unless you are like FC Cincinnati in your first year maybe. Well, you, you can't, those teams can't afford to not play every single game right now. Like a, a Houston Dynamo, Sporting Kansas City, they have to play like every game's a World Cup to give themselves a chance. But when you talk about Minnesota, Minnesota this weekend playing against FC Dallas, they didn't play like they needed to win that game. They, played, they rested a lot of players. There you go. I mean, but isn't that point. an Open Cup issue? They want us. They just played midweek in a high intensity match to get to the Open Cup final. Right, they're right. Trying to rotate. They're on the yeah, road. They're so trying, it goes but to my the point is, they're not. They're about. not the, with a full strength team. They they have a better chance to win. The, I understand. You got to rest players. You got to rest teams. I'm all for rotation. If the the team goes out and competes, which they did, but uh, we still see it, and, and, and it's not a hundred percent where you look across the league and you say. Oh, every team is playing their best eleven, and they're trying to win. And of course, you can rotate here and there. But when you watch a game, you're like, ah, oh, every team's giving a hundred percent. If you're asking that, there's there are definitely games throughout the season when teams can lose bad points. There are too many of them, right? Yeah. This to me is a question of this isn't just point blank. Are there too many teams in the playoffs? Like it's any other decision in the world. There's a good and a bad. There's a cost benefit to all of it. So. Would the regular season be games be better on average if there were less teams in the playoffs? Yes. I mean, if that's the question, there are games throughout the regular season that teams lose and it doesn't have enough consequence. But, I go back but there's to the a cost benefit, that- Andrew Defense. There's a cost benefit, right? This isn't a question of is it right or wrong. We do this with we do this with the schedule. Everything in Major League Soccer, people act like it's an easy decision, one or the other. There's a lot of people who are at least decently smart who make these decisions. There's whenever you make the decision, you realize there's 10 more factors. People like the playoffs. Playoffs are important. Why, do, why don't other sports go to the playoffs? Why does the NBA have, what, two full months, five rounds or four rounds of seven games? Because people like playoffs. So is Laton wrong that the regular season would be better? Probably not. But there's another element that you have to talk about here. And if you don't enjoy watching playoff games, then I personally love watching playoff games. Simple as that. It's single elimination this year. I think it matters. I also, again, and I haven't been there. You guys have been in the locker rooms, on the field, in playoff chases, in seasons maybe where it wasn't going to happen for you. Like, how is it not that 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 pressure, as you said, it just flows downhill? Like, we are fielding a professional soccer team. You are professional athletes. We would expect you, as people who would like to thrive in your given industry and advance and get paid more and win things and do whatever and have, you know, self-respect about the performance you're putting in. Because when it's when it's all said and done. You weigh up these two options. Would you rather be a Supporters Shield champion or MLS Cup champion? Mm-hmm. And every coach, every sporting director, general manager, owner will tell you it's always the latter. MLS Cup champion. Mm. Every time. Yep. But if you told me that the Supporters Shield champion gets a $10 million bonus per club and maybe some incentives like uh, an extra DP slot, uh, an extra foreigner, foreign slot, maybe some, um, it, just something that will make it that much more appealing. Then we'd we'd have more teams playing their full strength lineups to try and win, get that that trophy. But as long as the, the structure stays the way it is, if I'm a, if I'm a coach, I'm gonna say, I'm not going to to put all my eggs in the basket to be supporter shield champions and risk injuries and and uh, suspensions, whatever it is. If I can, you know, navigate the schedule well, put myself, put my team in a position where um, our team in a, in a position where we can, you know, get the third seed, fourth seed, second seed, whatever it is, and then and go go all in for the playoffs. That's every year we see the same thing. Teams that get hot towards the end of the year, uh, end of August, September, are usually the teams that make the MLS Cup final. Those are the the strong teams, the coaches that can turn it on, get get their players to play extremely well when it matters. Those are the teams that always wins. I'm going to say that oftentimes those are the best teams. You look at the last couple of years, they are the best teams. Yeah. Toronto, Atlanta, even Seattle before. I know they were having a tough time, but you go get Nico Lodero and like look at the roster, look at the way they were able to play. They had it in them. I don't know. I, I can, just, can you name me the, the last 10 Supporters Shield champions? Uh, probably, probably could off the top of my head. You could? Yeah, but I don't want to do that exercise right now. <laughs> so we only have 20 minutes left. Okay. Anyway, this is a very different, uh, this is a nuanced conversation. There's a lot of different angles to it, and I understand if you have different perspectives on it. Uh, Not winner for me from Week 23, Toronto. Orlando at home, 
They're a team that's around, hovering, trying to get above that playoff line, are currently below it on 33 points, eighth in the East. That was a game you got to win, especially with the amount of talent and investment you've had this summer. They did not. They drew it. Also, I'm going to say that Jesse Zardes and Columbus are not winners. Oh, yeah. Because hell is real. They went down 2-0 to FC Cincinnati, and it was like, oh, no, this is not good. Not at home. Not in the first rivalry match. Not what you want if you're a Columbus fan and what is a tough year so far. And then they came storming back. And then, unfortunately, inside the six-yard box, you can debate whether or not it's deflected by Kendall Just Watson. say it was deflected, dude. Just I say don't it was think it if was If I hear deflected. one more one more talk topic or chat of, of deflection, I'm going to lose it. I watched the slow-mo. And no, no, you're doing this wrong. It was definitely deflected, Charlie. Okay, sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it, there back was you, no – de- yeah, the only deflection was off the crossbar. There was That that part was a deflection. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, I felt terrible for Jesse in that moment. He had an opportunity to win that game. He hit the post later, I think. They had two headers saved. In the end, it was a 2-2 draw, and the first hell is real. We'll get another one in Cincinnati during Heineken Rivalry Week. Uh, Bobby, you have a not winner? Mm-hmm. Keep it quick. We'll keep it rolling. I think you got to take Sporting Kansas City at home. They go up a goal early, and then they lose the Real Salt Lake – you got to think they're donezo. Right now they're on 28 points. It probably takes 49 to make it in the playoffs in the West. They have 10 games to get 21 points, so they need seven wins in the end. Sporting Kansas City with a big, big miss this weekend. I, I told you at All-Star, stick a fork. Done? Right in them. Yeah, done. But the the flip side is for all you Sporting Kansas City fans is you can build for the future. Think about what we need to do in the this offseason. Who are we going to keep? Who, who, what positions do we need to invest in and, and go from there? What profile are we going to be within MLS? From spending, because the spending has been ramped up by a lot of teams, uh, identity of players. Are you still sort of that high press? Then you went to the possession. What is the tactical side that you need to go with? Peter Vermees has some work to do, no doubt about that. Uh, before we get to David Goss, Atlanta United, and Joseph Martinez, who's now scored in 10 straight games, I want to talk Revs. We said we were going to learn something about them. LAFC, Seattle, I think it's Red Bulls next. Bruce Arena after a 3-3 draw at Central League said, quote, this was a game of accidents and a, uh, uh, a, I don't know how I would say this without cursing, a blank show. Mm -hmm. Because there were a lot of goals, there were reviews, there's a lot going on. The New England Revolution are legit. Let's, let's Let's put it that way. They're not we bad. Define they're not legit. bad. They're legit. Yeah, they're not they're bad. They're legit. Not bad. legit. legit. They're not bad. Well, I'll define legit. Legit is a competitor. They're going to be a playoff team. We we can we agree on that? They're going to be yeah, in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I think I'm I think I'm with you on that one. Okay, two. They had back to back two of arguably the best teams in the league. So LAFC at home, which I think they they could have gotten a result. They had the opportunities. They they played well at times. Um, which is something to hang I your think, hat on right now with LAFC. We right, could have got a right, result. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, they saw LAFC is a better team. It's just a better team. That's it. We lost to a better team. We could have we could have done better, but better team. Great. Hand clap clap to LAFC. Yeah. Well done. We travel to Seattle. Now let's really test how good we are. To come out away with with a point and they had the lead and they had to fight back to, on two occasions. That's the character that you need to to make a run. They know they have it now. Carlos Hill is the newcomer of the year. Let's just give it to him now. What he's done, he's got nine goals, ten assists. If we can all talk about one thing that Friedel did well with this team, it's it's getting Carlos Hill. Re- remarkable player. He's he's gifted at at his his first touch, dribbling. He can he can ride tackles. His service is is second to none. The left foot, you know, he's all left, but you can't stop it. Kind of like Carlos Vela, but he doesn't have the pace or the acceleration that Carlos Vela does. But he's he's. He's very good at finding players in the right spots. Uh, Gustavo Bo, fantastic signing for for Bruce Arena. Uh, Kurt Anolfo uh, scouted him a while ago, so it, it made sense for him to go out and splash the cash to get him. Game changer. So when you when you talk about those two players, they are legit. They're going to compete. How good can they be this season? We see Michael Mancien come into the lineup. Scores a goal, his first goal for the club off a corner. He's making everyone better. I, that's what blows my mind. Uh, a couple months ago, everyone was like, "Oh, what a what a what a miss with Michael Mancien. The guy can't, you know, he he's just can't adjust to the league." Well, he comes right in and boom, a goal off a set piece. Uh, Seattle is going to be tough for anyone to play on the road, but they're legit. They're legit. 
Uh, Al- Alistair Brewer asked, uh, current Sanders team equals Chad Marshall theorem in reverse. Great team without a great center back is a mediocre team. Mm-hmm. Not sure about that one. We'll keep our eye on the Sounders. Uh, in the West, Bobby, somebody's mm-hmm. going to be disappointed at the end of this because somebody's going to finish outside in this pack. Mm-hmm. Right now, Portland Timbers, Houston Dynamo are bl- uh, below the playoff line. Mm-hmm. Looking like maybe Houston. Mm-hmm. Might be that team, but there'll be another one. Who's going to be disappointed into the Man, year? a couple weeks ago I would have said without a doubt it would be Real Salt Lake. That they just couldn't hang. Fine team who just couldn't hang with Portland and SKC and Dallas around them. But recently they are 5-1-2 and two in their last eight games, and they've deserved every bit of it. Before they were a street ball team, right? They had some talented attackers that could get the ball forward. Whoop, whoop, maybe they score, maybe they don't, but that's about it. Now where they are a legit defensive team with elite attacking talent. And in this league, if you get numbers behind the ball, if you defend hard and you have elite attacking talent, you have a chance. So I do think RSL are in. So who's disappointed? Man, that makes us question. You, I know you hate predictions. That makes us question way harder. I mean, the, the money at this point says Dallas because Portland are going to get in. I'll go ahead and say Galaxy, right? Because I believe that at some point, good teams rise to the top. The, Dal- the Galaxy are the worst soccer team of these eight teams on the top of the West. So I'll say the Galaxy drop oh, out. Whoa, whoa. Ooh. LAFC are the best. They're a top. They're going to win the Supporter Shield. Uh, as I said last week, I will print my column out and eat it, the paper, <laughs> if they don't do that. No doubt about it. Carlos Vela hit 38 goals plus assists this season. That ties Javinko uh, from way back. I think in 2015, his MVP year when he just lit the league on fire. He has 10 games left. He did this in about 2,030 minutes. That's insane. And meanwhile, Joseph Martinez is just three goals back of him in the Audi Golden Boot race. He might win the Golden Boot. He might break his own record. He might break his own record of 31 goals in a single season. He has no chance for the MVP. That is... It's locked up. That, that's Signed crazy. and sealed. That's crazy. LAFC knocking down the Red Bulls on Sunday night. Well done. Atlanta United knocking down NYCFC behind two goals from Joseph Martinez. Let's go now to Atlanta for at and call to the field. Normally, David Goss is sitting, oh, right where Bobby is sitting next to me. But this week, he's extra times. Mole on the ground in Atlanta. Dave, how's life? Wavy, you just tried to do that. We had to redo it. You can't just do it a second time and make it funny and natural. Well, come on. You, get, not a thing. you just don't want the mole to be a thing because we have the bird dog and he's coming up just a little bit. You know, we'll, we'll discuss oh, this. Oh, wow, in- you're having Sam on while I'm not there? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man, best show ever. I know, I know. We'll discuss this uh, internally once we get off the line with you. Uh, let's just get it started. You were there for NYCFC. You'll be there for Campanis Cup on Wednesday. That's on ESPN2, Univision, as well as TSN. Uh, Joseph Martinez in the flesh. It's now 10 straight games with a goal. It's got to be truly a pleasure. I know when I see him field side, it's like you get the tingles. Well, watching him dunk on someone is like, I didn't know I had courtside seats to an NBA game. Like, he flew on that first goal, and you could feel the impact of him going up and, like, the crowd re- reacting to it. Yeah, it's a special experience to watch him. I think Frank DeBoer said it best after the game. He demands more of himself. So he demands more of everyone else. To watch him yell at his teammates when he doesn't get the ball where he wants it, to interact with them, to demand of himself, like, on chances no one should be finishing, to, like, punch his own head and be like, why did I not finish that? Uh, it's always something special. And then just the pure athleticism and skill. The, the building gets a buzz every time he gets near the ball in the final third because you know he can score every time he touches it, and it's unique. Goss, the Justin Merrim trade was one of those hugely overrated moves. Overrated? Underrated, yeah, sorry. So, underrated. He, he looks like he's got a pep in his step. He's, he's, he looks like he's, he's reborn. Do you get that sense, and what has been the difference for him since he's come into this Atlanta team? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with what you're saying, Charlie. I think right now for him – He's a confidence player because he's a creative wing player, and he sees the opportunity he has in that. When he picks up the ball playing as a wing back with Barco, PC, and Joseph on the field, he's always going to be in 1v1 situations. A lot of times he's picking up the ball already at pace or he's picking it up on a through ball to run at a guy, and so he knows the opportunity that he has for him. What was interesting was chatting with him, and he said, when I found out I was going to play this position, I called former coaches that have worked with me that have played this formation and what they look for in wingbacks, and I called other players that I know that have played this position. So he's done the research to understand not just going forward and creating chances, but what his responsibility is throughout. He understands the running that's necessary, the communication defensively, staying engaged, which allows for him to do the things that he does great because – you can't be a sieve defensively on one end 
And right now, you know you're going to get something from him offensively, and it's helped change the way they play. But uh, he's made this spot his own, and they're telling me now that I've been down here that George Bellows a few weeks away, and it was assumed he would be the starter, but I think now it's, it's a serious conversation. A what? What was that word you used? Did you hear that? A serious conversation? No. What'd you, a what starter? Did you, what did you call Miram? Miram's What's defensive up, game? Div? <laughs> is that, did you, what's the definition? Can you give us the root of that word, please? Uh, it, it is a thing that, it's like a colander or a strainer. Ooh, it's, the, what, it's what like uh, math people call uh, goaltenders in hockey because they're always giving up goals. It's like offensive. That's why I like you, I like, Yeah, I like the colander drop there as well. Yeah, I like that people bringing yeah. kitchen, kitchen yeah, tools uh-huh, into soccer sure. conversations. Hey, talk to us about Petey Martinez, Dave. You know, I saw him a few weeks ago against D.C. United. I thought he played well. He came off the bench, and it felt like he would start to get his confidence back. I think you're starting to see – in the media, his personality come out more and more, which is he's a bit of a jokester. He's confident. He's a little cocky, and that's kind of who he is, but he hasn't been able to be that because he hasn't been scoring goals. So I think he's starting to find space and feel more comfortable. And I think coming up on Wednesday night is a big opportunity for him in that Club America is going to play the way he wants to play, which is they're going to leave space in midfield for you to pick up possession because Liga MX teams, they play basically like a basketball game on two ends. So he can operate and transition if he chooses to, or he'll have time to pick up the ball, get comfortable, and find people. So I think that game will fit him really well, and I think over the last five weeks we've seen him get better and better and more and more comfortable. Um, and I think Frank DeBoer has found a space to say, okay, here's my structure, and then you can find space to be creative. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You get to go about it. Is the whole Frank DeBoer and players not liking either the way he plays or whatever it is, is that overblown? Did we just kind of sit in the studio and, and keep pounding on it? And I know that look like LGP talked about it at All Star, and yeah, there keeps they being literally said to... it. How can you blow it? They, okay. It was their words. True, true. Three, not were... even one. Three of them used the words. Dave, you were in the locker room. Does it feel like they're kind of over that? Does it feel like they're saying, okay, now things are going well. We can just leave that in the past. I think they're winning, so everyone's always going to be happier, right? And everyone's more comfortable. But we talked to Julian Gressel this morning, and he said the first few weeks through preseason into the beginning of the season, all we worked on was defensive shape. And it was mainly geared towards defensive shape and defensive principles. And he said now it's completely opposite, where we're working on the attack, we're talking about the attack. And he even said when you watch the game, some of their moments where both wing backs get forward or Franco Escobar and Julian Gressel get forward. That's stuff that they just wouldn't have tried, you know, at the beginning of the See, season. See, defending's so not fun. No one likes to defend. That's it. That's what it comes down to. It's absolutely true, and on top of that, but you can understand, Charlie, for Frank DeBoer, okay, I'm going to come in. I want to build my base. My base is, here's what we do defensively, and once I trust that, then I can add to the attack. You know what's re- sorry, just to, to add to that, you know what's really funny about that too, David, is for everything we think about Atlanta United last year, how did they win MLS Cup? They were a defensive team. Five in the back, solid in the middle, play long. So I don't. It, it feels like we didn't factor that in to Frank DeBoer coming in and saying, "Let's solidify the defense and hope our talent does it." Because that's that's exactly how Martino won MLS Cup in the playoffs. So go back to your. Well, question. It, was, it was also solidified, but keep possession. Let's be a possession based team. Mm-hmm. Guys are like, mm, uh, possession doesn't feel right to me. I don't want to just swing the ball from left to right, and I want to attack. I want to get in behind defense. I want to have Al Marone uh, running behind people on the dribble or getting a through ball and breaking lines. That was Atlanta. That was exciting because they were creating chances. They were generating opportunities for everyone, especially Joseph Martinez. I want to get the Campinas Cup in just a second, but I heard that background noise, Dave. Where um, are you? The hummus shop. Is it You're the, at the hummus hum- spot? Where mm-hmm. are you? No, I am going to Rumi's Kitchen tonight, which Justin Miram has promised me is the best Middle Eastern food in the area. But currently I'm at Ponce Market because, you know, when in Atlanta. When in Atlanta, Wednesday night, Campeones Cup, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch on Univision, 2 de N, ESPN2, TSN, Club America, the Campeon de Campeones. we got to call David out, dude. David, what? how mad would you be as somebody who does radio for a living if you didn't interview with somebody on the phone and they were out getting food while this interview was taking place. And now you're going to do it to us? Now you're going to have background noise? It sounded like an animal. It sounded like an animal. Yeah. How are you going to do it? What kind of professional radioist are you? It's it's as mad as I would be if someone told me, hey, we're going to do an interview at this time and called me 20 minutes early when I wasn't in a quiet area. Mm. That's how mad I would be. So you're furious. That's good. Uh, How much does (laughs) Campeones Cup matter? What kind of team uh, is Atlanta going to put out here? 
Listen, there's a chance that at the end of this week we could say Atlanta United is the campeon of the Campeones Cup where they defeated the campeons of the Campeones de Campeones, <laughs> which is the ultimate honor that you could put on a team. Um, in, in reality, and being less joking, uh, they know that it's one game for a trophy. They, they feel bitter about the way it ended against Monterey in, uh, in CCL for them. That's the only time they've ever gotten to face a Liga MX side in official competition. So they know all those things. They know the crowd's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a pretty split mix between Club America and um, Atlanta United. It sounds like they're only going to open the lower bowl, so it'll be between 45 and 50K. Uh, for Atlanta United fans, you get your season ticket package. You get one additional game. That was the CCL game. So they all have to buy an additional ticket for this game. So now you see an opportunity for Club America fans to get tickets. I think we'll see a split lineup for Atlanta uh, Gabor talked after the game about Joseph. He wanted to take him off earlier, but because NYCFC scored, he felt like he had to keep him on. So now probably Tito Vialba starts up top in this game. And then you look at Lorentowitz and Florentine Pogba and Michael Parkhurst. They can all come into the lineup. You'd expect to see them. So I think when you look at it, you'll say this is a good team. I would expect to see P.T. Martinez start because of the form he's in um, and maybe Andrew Carlton as well in that attack. So I think it'll be a team that's a good team but it'll definitely be rotated from what you saw against NYCFC. Lots of 1v1 matchups in this game because, as you said, Club America will probably open up the field. I also hear there's a 1v1 matchup in the offing between you and one Chuck D, Charlie Davies, on the basketball court. You have sprinkled in a number of references to basketball, and now I hear you're going to smack Charlie maybe down at Pier 5. I don't know where. Yeah, no, probably Pier 2. That's where the courts are. Also, Weeby, come on, one-on-one, one v one, one, one is soccer. Oh, uh, I see, you know, he doesn't even know basketball. Yeah. But Charlie doesn't know basketball either. I played high school basketball. Charlie did it because he was like a world-class wrestler or something weird like that. And I told him I could beat him one-on-one. -on -one. I've got the size. I've got the post game, which I can do because it's just one-on-one -on -one and no one can come over and help block me. I feel like I could take Charlie down. See, he feels, he feels like he could take me. I'm not losing. There, at the end of the really day, I'm not losing about, like, one on one to Degas. It's just not happening. Yeah. I'm going like, to beat him. Athlete, we're gonna so we're gonna get this on. We're gonna have this extra time radio live I, from the court. Pure there's, two. There's one important question, and uh, I think I'm gonna let Dave make this decision. How are fouls going to be called in this one on one matchup? Super tight. Super tight. <laughs> Charlie will hack me all day because he can't stay with my quick first step. <laughs> nice. David Goss is down at Campeones Cup. That's on Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, ESPN2, Univision, Turiani, TSN, the pregame show and postgame show right here from this studio, the AT&T MLS Studios in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Charlie, Kalen Carr, and myself bringing you all that as well as, I believe, highlights and analysis from the other games going on that night because this is a busy Wednesday in MLS. Uh, get back to Ponte Market, Dave. Thanks, guys. Have fun. Ooh, I think I got my money on Charlie, but uh, I don't know. I think Dave's going to be a tougher challenger than you think. He's scrappy. He's oh, scrappy. Yeah. He's going he's gonna to try and use his body. Yeah, for get, sure. Get fouls. Uh-huh. He's so, gonna, <laughs> go to the line. Just, oh, throwing the hands up, making a lot of noises on any sort of contact. Uh, that's going to be fun to watch. Not so fun uh, talking about this. Uh, Mike Pecky terminated as the head coach of Real Salt Lake. Let's just go through these facts here. We'll get to Sam Stage with a little more insight for you. Uh, July 30th, following League's Cup against Tigres, a few days before, RSL suspended Mike Pecky without pay for two weeks. Also, there was a three-game suspension in Major League Soccer and League's Cup and a $25,000 fine. It was a huge punishment for what was uh, described as this. At the conclusion of that quarterfinal against Tigres, Pecky used a homophobic slur, uh, which led to immediate suspension by Real Salt Lake, and after the conclusion of this investigation, uh, the termination of his contract. We will we'll get to Sam on some of those details and how all of that went down, but long story short, after some self-examination, self Real Salt Lake had this statement following the termination. At Real Salt Lake, we have the privilege to represent our great community and fans here locally and on a national and global basis. We hold all of our coaches, players, executives, and staff to the highest standards of professionalism. As an organization, it is vital that everyone, particularly our leadership, reflects and embodies our core values and the values of our community, treating all people with respect, civility, and professionalism. Moreover, throughout our 15-year history, we have championed diversity, acceptance, and inclusion throughout our organization, our stadiums, and our community. This is a responsibility that we take very seriously. In the end, they felt it was their responsibility to terminate Mike Pecky as their head coach. Uh, before we get to Sam, are there any thoughts here, guys? Anything to add? 
you know, other than I, th- I think would be to me one of the obvious things, which is Mike Pecky's kind of rode the line um, as it pertains to his outbursts. They've often been against referees or, you know, in other instances. Um, and in some ways, including this show, they've been celebrated. Um, but there is a line. And when you cross that line, and in this case, um, use a homophobic slur, whether or not you are a homophobe, which I I can't say for sure that Mike Pecky is. I don't know that. I do know that I've seen him in a variety of positions in the community and in public settings, including on his radio show with Laura Harvey, uh, who is openly gay, who is the manager uh, of the NWCL team in Utah, supporting the LGBTQ community, uh, showing that side of him. And and so it was a little surprising to see this. But when you cross that line as a leader, you you pay the price. And it it seems that Mike Pecky is paying that price. Yeah, I think you said it right. Doesn't seem to be a person that that has a, an issue with this, but he he crossed the line. Some people who say these things do have an issue, right? And they probably are bad people. It doesn't seem like Mike Petkey is one of those people. He said a thing that is warranting. You can't say. You can't say. Yeah, you can't say. You shouldn't say. Those are the consequences as yeah. as a leader, as a coach. You represent your your team, your your community, the league. It's just unacceptable, and that, those are the repercussions. All right, let's talk to Sam Stachel of the Athletic right now to shed some more light on this situation. Uh, Sam, what's up, man? Not too much, guys. How's it going today? It is going well. Always good to talk to the Bird Dog. These are uh, some unhappy circumstances, I think, certainly for Mike Pecky, and I think for all of us who don't want to see this thing out in the world. Let's just start with what happened. What happened here? Yeah, so obviously, um, you know, Mike Petkey berated officials um, after RSL lost their League's Cup match to Tigres on July 24th. I reported last week that that included um, a Spanish-language homophobic slur, um, which, you know, you hear pretty commonly, unfortunately, around stadiums in in North America. Um, Anyone that's listening to this is probably familiar with the word. Um, So that you know, continued down the tunnel from on the field down into the tunnel. And then even, you know, with a note that was flipped under the door of the referee's locker room. So he got a super strict, harsh suspension, pretty much one of the the biggest suspensions I can really remember in any sport um, for any coach. Um, It was three games in in leagues cup, which would be served at a later date. Uh, It ended up being three games in MLS, a $25,000 fine. And and he was not allowed to, to be in contact with the team. Um, for a period of two weeks and was docked you know, and wasn't paid for those two weeks either. So he was set to return um, today, Monday, um, to the team and resume his duties. Um, but RSL ended up firing him last night. So that's kind of what's all out there. That's what, that's what we, that's what's publicly known at the moment. Um, and then, you know, there are some more details that are kind of starting to emerge um, from people that I've been talking to and I'll have an article about this on the athletic, but um, from what I've been told, um, Pecky was given an option to resign um, that included, um, uh, uh, would have included, had he taken it, um, a payout in the low six figures. Um, obviously, he did not end up taking that. Um, and from what I've been told, RSL is, is expecting him to fight for the salary that's remaining on his contract, um, which was set to run which was through the 2020 season, so another year and a half, essentially. Um, and so we'll see how that all unfolds, but, uh, you know, definitely some interesting times out in Salt Lake, uh, a lot of drama out there and, um, you know, some of it will continue here, especially if they get into kind of a, a legal fight. So we'll see where it goes. We will see where it goes. Sounds like no end in sight for this one. Of course, Freddie Juarez is now the interim head coach for the rest of the year. We know him from the Academy and Real Monarchs. Uh, does he have a chance at this full-time job? What might the club look for in their next head coach? Yeah, I mean, I think he does. You know, if you look at RSL's history here um, since Jason Christ left, um, and even even before uh, Jason Christ left, every head coach that they've appointed has come within the organization, starting with Jason Christ, who retired as a player to take over his coach in 2007, and then continuing with Jeff Kassar, who was an assistant under Christ and then took over for him after he left for NYCFC, and then with Pecky, who was the their USL head coach um, before he um, before Kassar was fired he took over in 2017. Even if you go down to USL, it's followed a, a similar pattern there in terms of how they've hired. So I think Freddie Juarez, who's been with the team for a long, long time, I think over a decade now, um, if you include his time down in Arizona with the academy, um, and, and then a few years as a first-team assistant, uh, I think he absolutely has a shot. And RSL has actually been playing pretty well recently here, too. So 
um, you know, if he can continue um, that trend and if the team makes the playoffs and potentially gets a high seed or a home game, I think he has every shot in the world. Um, he'll definitely continue for the rest of the season. That's the plan for them, um, no doubt, from what I've been told. I mean, they, they basically announced that in their press release um, about the firing. Um, but we'll see. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll have some options, I would imagine, in the wintertime if they choose to move on from Freddie. Um, but, yeah, I think he'll have, he'll have every opportunity um, to make this job his own. Sam, to have some fun with it, what are the chances that either A, they would offer the job to Kyle Beckerman, or B, that Beckerman would take it right now? Oh my God! I have no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Does that I not? Sorry, sorry. I don't mean to bring that out of the blue, Sam. Does that not feel like? For you. But that um, is maybe a return of Jason Christ. That would not be a huge shock to me if that's something that ended up happening or something that RSL tried to make happen. Um, he is going to be back in Salt Lake. They're doing a ten-year reunion, um, I believe, for their uh, for their MLS Cup championship, and, and he'll be back out there for that. So. Um, you know, who knows? That would be an interesting one. I'm sure a lot of the fans out there would be intrigued by that situation. Um, but we'll see. I mean, one name that kind of jumps out to me as a natural fit would be Tab Ramos as well. I know he's he's been mentioned with basically every MLS vacancy here over the last few years, but he's coached a lot of those RSL guys with the U20s. Um, obviously has the ability, uh, the fluency in Spanish, so he can kind of connect with, with the Spanish-speaking portion of the locker room as well. Um, so that would seem to be a pretty natural fit if they decide to move on from from Juarez. Um, but we'll see. They have they have time on that one. That Beckerman one would be uh, would be pretty crazy. I don't see that happening, but that would be uh, that would be wild. Just do it for the content. Come on, Real Salt Lake. Just kidding. Look, <laughs> uh, some uncertainty right now for the club trying to figure things out as it stands. What we know, Mike Pecky terminated as the head coach of Real Salt Lake. The details there from Sam Stachel at the Athletic. You can go check him out uh, behind the paywall, which I happily pay for, Sam. I want you to know that. I made sure to, to get that done for you. So uh, good to talk to you as always. We'll look forward to that article, okay? Thanks, boys. Have a good one. All right, these are tough but necessary conversations. Thank you to Sam Stachel for shining some light on that for us and giving us some additional details. We'll stay tuned on this one. It sounds like there is more to come, and I believe there's an article out on The Athletic if you want to read more about that one. I did think the Kyle Beckerman question was interesting. You seem to think it's close to a, you know, you're betting on it here. So where does that come from? I, I would make a bet right now that Kyle Beckerman is the manager of Real Salt Lake at some point. It doesn't come from anywhere specific, but... I'm fairly sure his contract is up at the end of the year. He's on 325000 according to the release from the Players' Union. If Charlie, if I were to come to you, you're on the last year of your deal. You're a club legend. You've been there for how long has he been there? Ten years, right? It, it, my understanding is he has some interest in getting into coaching. You know, I, I apologize if that's wrong, but that's my understanding. If they offered you a three-year guaranteed at the same money, and said we weren't going to pick up, aren't going to pick up your option. But if you hang up the boots right now, we give you three years guaranteed the same amount. You take it, even if you want to play another year or two. As you get to that age, you think, what's the next step in my life? What's the next step to make decent money? If you're interested in coaching, yes, you you take it. Uh, although some people might say, I want to get necessary experience, so I'm I'm set up to succeed and not set up to Who's fail. Who's saying? Nobody's saying. I mean, yeah, that's what they say when they don't get the job. Uh, if they no. offer you the manager of the club that will put up a statue for you in front of the stadium, you take that job, even if you want to play for a couple more years. It's a it's a difficult proposition. And this club has done this, right? They gave it to Jason Christ while he was a player. You know, a different era in Major League Soccer. For sure. They gave it to Jeff Kassar when Je- when when Jason Christ left. They gave the job to Mike Petke, promoted from the Monarchs. Remember that he was with the USL team, promoted up. I think it's different now nowadays. I think there there is. Uh, an outlook as far as what is it going to look like in three years if I have no experience and I'm taking a massive job with all the pressure now on the league. Especially this post, pre- post Brad Friedel too. Yeah, this this pressure wasn't there when Jason Christ was taken over, when Ben Olsen and Jay Heaps and all these young guys went from player to coach. Nowadays, it matters. Because if you go these three years and you fail and you get fired, what's what's next? You know, you, you, you need to build yourself up. You need to work in the trenches. And I think that's an important part of, of, of uh, us as former players now. We didn't like that guys got the job right out of the bat with no experience. I'll do it. RSL, you want me to do it? I will do it right now. Okay? <laughs> you don't even have to pay me $300,000. I'll do it for less. I'm on, I'm on record with that, Charlie. Wow. I, I think we could see Salt Lake go say, you know what, Beckerman, we want you here. We'll give you another role. Maybe it's head coach of the Monarchs. Maybe it's an assistant coach to whoever they do hire, 
to give him that necessary experience so that when the job does come available the next go around, he's the candidate. Could be interesting. We'll see what happens with Raw Salt Lake. Let's go to the mailbag, 401-2060-MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Uh, I believe I cut you off, Bobby, at some point mm -hmm. when you wanted to say something about LAFC. Yeah, I don't want this. Do we have to do this in the mailbag? Can we get a producer, Anders, to cut this up higher in the show? Uh, not going to happen. So, Andrew, I think in the rundown somewhere you had what left is there to say? About LAFC. And it is this. Other people around Major League Soccer, watch their dang games, man. Watch them. Take notes. It is the weirdest thing in the world to me. Mostly because my world mostly revolves around soccer. That other teams, other coaches don't watch Pep Guardiola and Diego Simeone and sorry and Klopp and try and emulate what they do how do these masters the people who have made it to the top some of them like a sorry not even starting that high and you don't try and emulate what they do Bob Bradley is crushing everyone straight up because he coaches more right we have this idea that soccer should be a great game of creativity watch LAFC they have an answer for every second the goalkeeper has the ball the goalkeeper knows what his three options are if a is taken away he goes to b if b is and down the line the ball goes to the walkers in the center back he knows what his options are the ball goes into that west a decay they each know what they are supposed to do in every single moment and to steal the bob bradley line this is football whatever stupid idea you have in your head about players making decisions and creativity and express yourself watch this LAFC team run over everyone else so when we talk about minnesota we talk about who are the other teams that we try and that that people pretend are good the galaxy the seattle sounders last year portland at times look at this lafc team and tell me that what you do is the same sport that's it thank you for letting me say that I like Andrew. That. that was a good rant right there and sometimes not a rant well okay fine what would you do for a, a passionate um plea a passionate stance yes so sometimes on the show, elsewhere, other people, there seems to be, and you know, we're as guilty as anybody, do, kind of having the, like a jokey tone about Bob Bradley and Barca. But I think that's a good point. And that Bob Bradley said, you know what? I, I do want to coach this game at a higher level. I want to understand it. I want to teach it at a higher level. I'm going to go watch the best, and I am going to emulate and borrow and, and integrate into what I do. And we would be better off. If there were more coaches around the league saying, I want my team to look like this. I want this to be the goal that we're going for. And that's kind of what I was talking about in the pressure conversation. Higher expectations, and it comes from leadership. It comes from ownership. It comes from GMs, and it comes from coaches to say, you know what? You know what? I'm going to fly could, out yeah, and, we could, and watch right. Sorry, oh, and, also, and Guardiola we for might, a month. We might be able to coast a little bit. We're LAFC. we got a bunch of great players. We might be able to win MLS Cup, but I'm not here for mediocrity. I'm here to see you all perform at the absolute highest level you can every single game, and I'm going to hold you accountable for and, that. And continue like to it. learn. And yeah. continue to learn. You're yeah. not, just because you're a head coach doesn't mean you, you can't learn anything else and you can't go overseas and, and learn from the best. I, I would like to see more coaches travel to uh, Spain, England, and sit down with these coaches, ask them questions, stay at training sessions for a month at a time in the offseason and learn. And, and then bring it and back? And come back and implement it. Yes. Okay, we'll end here. Oh, no. I want to give the last very specific detail. What LAFC do exponentially better than everyone else, compared to the other possession teams especially, is they have a very clear idea on how to turn their use of the ball into goal-scoring opportunities. When you see Mark Anthony Kay or Carlos Vela or Latif Blessing get the ball between the lines or get the ball with an inch of space, you know, three yards to pick up their head, they know exactly how to turn those moments into scoring goals. The point of this game is scoring goals. They have very clear and replicable ideas and patterns on how to do it. Other coaches should take note. Philip J. Thrash, before we get out of here, he says he finds it amazing. There's only one team in the league with a positive away record. It's LAFC. Surprise, surprise. What do you think contributes to this? Is that teams on the road simply don't press as much, rather sit back, go for the result as we talked about? Uh, or is it the atmosphere? What is it? What is it about road games? Yeah, I mean, a lot of teams sit back and they try and absorb pressure, play on the counter. Uh, you talk about the, the intensity, the atmosphere, the environment. Uh, that puts pressure on the referee to sometimes make the, the uh, a sway decision. Uh, but again, New York City FC, Dame Tarant, this this uh, past weekend with Atlanta, Atlanta United, he said, we're going to play. We're not going to sit back. We come here to play the way we want to play. And they, they were exposed a little bit, but I was impressed with them because this wasn't their full lineup. When they have a full squad out there, they they I still think they're the best team in MLS. Whoa. Why, why, what? Whoa. Yeah. 
Right nope. now, I still think they're the best team in the Whoa, wow. Uh, sorry, not in the MLS, in the Eastern Conference. Eastern Conference, yeah. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Eastern Conference. Oh, Eastern a little Conference. confused yeah. there. Oh, thank, Oof, thank you, yeah. Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. All right. That's it for us. Big thank you to Sam Stagecool for uh, helping us out with the Mike Pecky situation, what's going down there right now, and what might come. Uh, the news, as you know, he is terminated as the head coach of Real Salt Lake. David Goss having fun, making the rounds, eating hummus in Atlanta. Campino's Cup is on oh. Wednesday. What is that? Um, Oh, the mole. Oh, I don't oh. think I can keep that going. I think we got to let that one die in this show. Uh, and thanks to you guys for joining me here in the at t MLS studios. We'll be back on Thursday. We'll see you then, everybody.